What's going on, good people of the internet? It is time for On Comics Grounds.com's flagship podcast, Panel to Panel, where a bunch of folks shoot the breeze and talk about comic books and such. We are back once again, once again. But as you can see, it is only me. It is only me and a very special guest. That means a lot to me personally. And I hopefully it means a lot to you, the listeners, because I am once again sitting down with Tate Bromble, author of Dark Horse and Jeff Lemire's Universe Bending transformative work of art that is the Black Hammer universe and his miniseries that is a part of it, Barbalian Red Planet. He is coming back to, uh, into the chair with me once again to talk about this book because it's finally wrapping up after five months of being published once a month for us. We have seen the end. We have seen Mark Marx's journey come to a close before the events of Jeff Lemire's Black Hammer. And it is quite honestly one of the most beautiful works of art i've ever seen in a comic book and i'm so glad that i was able to read this i was able to have tate on the first time and i get to have him on again right now for you to listen to um the need for more lgbtqia plus representation in comic books is such a need right now we talk about this episode that the need is so great that it's such so hard just to get gay representation in the door, let alone trans representation, bi representation, ace representation. It's damn near impossible right now. But because of this kind of stepping stone with this book, not only tackling the issue of gay representation, but talking about HIV AIDS, something that has been a problem in our country for so many years and something that so many of us have had to come to live with and be, make it a part of our lives is something that's been hard for a lot of us personally. And I gotta say, <laughs> it's something that kept me in the closet for a lot of years. And that's why this book means a lot to me because I've lost somebody who's dealt with this. So I just want to say thank you to Tate for taking the plunge and writing this book and making it a part of such a large scale universe because Barbie meant a lot to me when I was coming out and seeing him go on this journey even deeper into an issue that harkens home to me means so much. And Mr. Bromwell has also requested that in this episode we shout out and request support for the Asian Community Aid Service. It's a nonprofit community based organization located in Toronto, Canada. Um, they support safe sex education and services to the East and Southeast A Asian communities and support services to persons living with HIV AIDS and members of the LGBTQIA plus community. We all know that um, Asian American and Pacific Islander crime has been a thing. The hate crimes that have been done to them is just horrendous and they don't deserve to be attacked in this form so he wanted to shout out this organization because of the hard work they do to support those communities so i humbly ask that you if you have the, have the ability share the link if you are able to donate please do and i want to thank tate once again for shouting them out and for being a part of this episode because the big thing about panel to panel is it originally started as just a bunch of bros coming together as and talking about comics, but it's evolved into so much more. It's evolved into people who of color, people who are part of the LGBTQIA plus community and women coming together and talking about comic books, it's something that we've had to hide ourselves from ridicule of the nerd population for so many years and that dominated the comic book landscape and nerd culture still and they're catered to, catered to by their audiences like they're catered to by publishers and organizations to give them products they want rather than the products that people need desperately and want to be represented on the page the screen what have you and this show has become a monument in my opinion to the fact that we will not be silent we will not 
give up and we will talk about the things that matter to us. Like, yeah, we will have episodes like our previous episode where we talk about the Snyder Cut, but we will talk about the issues that matter. And you will see the next two weeks we talk about gay representation. We talk about bi representation and it does not matter what it is. We will talk about it. So thank you for listening to this podcast and thank you to Tate for giving me a book that means everything to me. Hope you enjoy. Um, I'm so excited to be back. Of course. Um, thank you for like joining us here again. I was about to say, we can just jump into it. I'll record an intro after we're done. I was say it's just it's so nice to have you back for this because like y- like this book has just meant so much to me the past few mo- like months. It's yeah. been just this thing that has like influenced me in such a major way and to finally see it close out i'm sad it's done like i like <laughs> even like even when you like, like like sent me the review copy i was like ah what the, like i'm excited but no i i want this to keep going and then you just tore my heart out with that final Aww. issue and it just <laughs> oh yeah i like hey. i was i know i've had like a few people already being like i don't want this to end and like I've just kind of been waiting for so long for this book to come out. And then suddenly, like even this podcast, I'm like, holy crap, it's ending. And I'm already back on this podcast. I feel like we just did the other episode. (laughs) So it happened so, or it seemed to happen so quickly. So I'm also like just now very sad that it's coming to an end as well. And what means so much to me is the fact that this podcast has been on hiatus for a hot minute because of like COVID and pe- like people mm-hmm. working and people being sick. But for it to come back on this high note of not only oh. this podcast, but also the Snyder Cut, two things <laughs> that have cre- like created such a buzz. Not only have you made such a big splash with this book being such a symbol of gay culture in comic books, you see the Snyder Cut being this respect to creators as such a big thing. So these two different products showing that creators can create their vision in the way they want and it be accepted by cre- like by the, the, the majority of like nerd culture is such a milestone. Like a couple years ago, this comic would not be accepted. Like, Black Hammer in itself had to make Barbie be a part of an ensemble to get his story out there. Things like uh, Midnight and Apollo, Batwoman, these mm-hmm. books that took years to finally be accepted. And even yeah. now, you don't even see them getting their, their own solo titles. There's yeah. still a, such a struggle for us to be accepted by comic book culture. Mm-hmm. And to see you get this shine in a miniseries is such a great touchstone for us. Yeah, it, like, it doesn't fully I like clue in for me just because it is such a big deal when I start to think about it but honestly like you said none of it would be possible without Batwoman without Midnighter and Apollo without those all those creators like Steve Orlando kind of paving the way and then this book in particular would not have happened without like Jeff Lemire's just allyship Indeed. and kind of he literally was like, you're going to do this and we're going to make this happen and you can do whatever you want, say whatever you want. And then the editorial let me do whatever I want. So it's just like this, I don't know, it's hard because while it was happening, I thought I'd get pushed back or like people would be like, I don't know if you can do this, Tate, or this maybe this is a little bit too gay because I hear that so often from creators. And it, this was just a rare opportunity where no one stepped in and was like, date you need to like back off or not do it this way um well well, like if you don't mind back up a little bit like creator speaking on it's too gay that's something that like we've dealt with not only from nerd culture but just society as a norm is that us being who we are is such like a taboo we're constantly dealing with not only toxic wanting us to be a certain way but just like heteronormativity like how Mm -hmm. how has that influenced you when it comes to the book well even in regards to that like how some editors are saying or just in general in world in the world are saying um something is too gay i actually heard from a queer writer a couple weeks ago on a current project coming out um where i'm not gonna like say too much about it but he was told that it wasn't gay enough <laughs> and, oh. But in like a weird way where like he was telling this authentic or they were telling this authentic kind of story 
the way that they intended, and then the editor said they wanted it to be more gay. And he kind of like, almost like a as, stereotype, maybe almost like a stereotype, as in like that's not the type of gay we were looking for, which is like another like the complete opposite, but also infuriating. So it's just yeah, all of those things. That's nutty. Like, yeah. So it it just that stuff really it frustrates me, and I didn't. I don't know if I knew how lucky I was when I was making this project because I was kind of so just zeroed in on doing, like writing it and making sure it was good enough. But then looking back, I've kind of, and now that it's out in the world, I've really kind of realized like how special this book is and it's becoming more and more, I don't know, clear in a way. It really is. And I like, when when issue one dropped and we had our first talk, like you mm-hmm. could tell for me this book meant a lot. And then issue five comes out and specifically like like three and five, because three meant a lot to me because of the fact of Dr. Day's story. But mm-hmm. then you get to issue five and this culmination of everything, you not only see like, Are we gonna um, wait? Should we warn people of spoilers? Oh, you're yeah, right. You are so <laughs> right. I apologize. Um, I, I'll make sure to like, like to hit it up in like in the intro. I'll record, but like, yes, okay, no, okay. of course, <laughs> double warning for folks. Um, spoilers ahead. We're we're jumping straight in. Like five issues. The book drops. Uh, like, we're, we're recording on Saturday. The book drops Wednesday, so this will be coming out the day of release. So please go support your local comic book shops. Please support this mm-hmm. book, obviously, but. In regards to this book, like issue five as a whole, it's this giant culmination. And like one thing that like it just um one thing I, I like we talked about previously that I want to bring back up is I worry that the like the fact that this is a prequel and we're jumping in before Black Hammer fully takes off, mm-hmm. there's so much growth here. There's so much like stuff here for Barbie, I'm worried that Mark's like like gonna have like a regression rather like like when it gets to Jeff rather than what you have here. There's so much growth here. Him even telling his partner to like to f off at the end. I was like, yes, this is great. <laughs> I want to see him go off in like a, like like a whole different like timeline and mm-hmm. do his own thing. And then you get we get into Jeff's st- part of the story, and I'm just like, no, <laughs> I want more. <laughs> Yeah. Well, here's the like the way that I am viewing that is I know this is part of a larger universe, um, but really these stories are standalone and they like exist on their own. And I know pe- everyone like loves the interconnectedness, but I kind of had to remove myself from that. Um, even though I played a lot of, especially in the final issue, there's a lot of callback kind of moments from early Black Hammer issues where we kind Indeed. of see new versions of these events. But I kind, but I also, I don't know. I don't want. I just, I, I love what Jeff does, and obviously he brings something else to the character. But like, I really, I love that this story kind of exists on its own, and I don't know what's planned for Barbie afterwards. But like, I don't want that to like change people's. Oh, of course not. And stuff. and like, um, there's this moment, um, in I think issue like Black Hammer two or th- like three or four, mm-hmm. where he first meets the priest, and it feels like. I want to say, like, issue one of your version of Barbie, where it's like, he's just now starting to accept himself. Versus Mm -hmm. here, he's had a whole journey, and there's even that moment in issue four where the one dude, after he reveals himself, goes, I don't even think Barbalian knows who who he is. And Mm -hmm. that struck a chord with me, because that's that's a a journey we all deal with, where Mm -hmm. we don't know who we are. We struggle with conditioning of heteronormativity on the daily from society society for media and yeah. it's it's been a struggle for me for a long time so to see, to hear somebody say that on a page is mm-hmm. just so different from any other comic book i've ever read mm-hmm. and it's just insane because you get to issue five and miguel's ready for a suicide mission he's ready to go out swinging for what he believes in and then mark has to fight an uphill battle just to get back to him and it's so heartbreaking Mm -hmm. well i'm i'm honestly glad you um brought up that one line of the one guy uh saying like like, i'm glad you like that resonated with you because a lot of these lines um it's really hard to balance like nuance and just like having someone come out and say a line that you want people to read. Mm. So, but then at one point, and this came in the writing of it, 
where I kept being like, oh no, I need to add more nuance. Like these people can't be just straight up saying these things. Um, but then there came to a point where I kind of just realized that I have been like living my life in nuance. Yeah. Like I have been kind of double checking everything I've said, everything I've done. I've lived in the small glances that I've seen of, from someone across the room. And it's just like, I've survived off of nuance and like that wasn't enough and that wasn't nourishing. So I kind of was like, if I'm gonna do this book, I'm gonna just fuck nuance and I'm just gonna <laughs> have this opportunity. And like, I want people, I want my points to be made and I want people to know, to know what I'm trying to say and I don't know, understand. So a lot of that, and I think I know that I've seen some, I've seen like a couple people online be like, oh, there's not enough nuance or people don't, people wouldn't be kind of open like this or saying everything they're just like this <laughs> on the nose almost. See, but like, I just was like, I, I'm, I'm doing that because I don't yeah. want any of this to be taken the wrong way. I want to, to just be like very clear. And, and like, I think the biggest thing that's actually been helping me a lot. And like, I started like binge watching the entire show recently is shameless because the, that's the biggest comparison I can make here between this and that is the new, they say screw nuance. They say like, fuck nuance. We're going to go on the record and talk about what matters here, which is the realness of the gay struggle, whether mm -hmm. it be like, like struggling too young, whether it be in your case, n not knowing who you are. Like Mark walks in and takes the identity of something off a poster. He doesn't know who he is. He mm -hmm. created this identity for himself because he didn't think anyone on Earth would accept him, not only as a Martian, but as a gay Martian, no less. And there's that moment in the first issue where um, his partner literally goes, yo, I would turn your ass in right now if you weren't a good cop. If you weren't a really good cop, you would be at the top brass right now. It would not matter. And then as the, the book goes on, you get to that moment at the end where his partner even tries to stop him from quitting the force. And he goes, no, fuck you. Like, he's done. I don't care. And it's just the, the growth of a, of a character right there shows the, like, the, the power that you have with this story. You show realness. Like, because like, nuance can be great at times. But when in the day and age where we can't even get an ongoing book for a gay character, let alone mm -hmm. the, like, the calls out. And I, um, one of my writers had a great piece this past week speaking about the need for uh, trans representation. I remember my staff wants ace representation in comic mm -hmm. books that where, where there's like none. Like that was the big thing that he noticed from the, the, the DC and Marvel pride um, anthologies was a lack mm -hmm. of, of ace representation. And it's these other things that are constantly here that are just non-existent in comic book media. You said, screw everything. I'm going to put it out all there for us to see. And I applaud you for that. You've brought these real things to the table for real people. Yeah, I'm just, I'm honestly just glad it's, it's resonating and resonating with like the right people and the people I wanted it to resonate with. Um, yeah. Because you're right, I did not know if I would ever get a chance to write a book like this again um, or just another book in general. So I just like, I really just wanted to make my points clear and I'm glad that they are and that, and now I can be happy basically. <laughs> I like honestly, like I, I want to see if, if Jeff will let me write a Doctor Day story at this point because I, I want to just keep the saga going on after this. Like you've opened doors and created pathways, and at this point, if if you can do this with a character that someone else created, I want to see what you can do with your own. I want to see whether it be a Kickstarter or another platform. I want to see what you can do on your own. Yeah, well, hopefully someday. Um, that's the plan. Um, yeah, I definitely, in terms of like adding these new characters, whenever I'm kind of open, um, entering these new universes, I always want to be additive and like kind of create more opportunity for either the original creator or more writers to come in and kind of take over and I don't know, just always more avenues of story. Um, so yeah, Doctor Day is my favorite edition. Um, I love Nightclub, of course. Um, yeah, there's just, there's so much opportunity. I don't know what's going to happen moving forward, but I'm just, I'm glad they all exist and they're all my babies. <laughs> it, definitely. Like, like, I think what meant a lot for me is the fact of compared to something like 
Falcon and Winter Soldier, which this past week really irritated me because not only the racism aspect, which I'm glad they they addressed that because racism has been a struggle for black characters in general, but the disrespect to Sam as a character changing his origin to be more of a stereotype because his original origin was very much, hey, you, like um, I'm from Brooklyn. My father was a a, pre- a preacher who who was gunned down by gang violence. They said, no, we're not going to do that. We're going to make him a Louisiana fisherman. What? And from the and like in in contrast, you have created a character not only who is gay, who is black. Uh, like the, she decided to step away from being a superhero and care about the like, like the people like that matter most in the worst of circumstances in a Catholic church, no less. And <laughs> she had a whole legacy of superheroing behind her, but she chose to care about the people who matter, and that spoke volumes to me so much. And she even decides to come and help out them on the front line and pick up her father's mantle, and that was huge. Like holy crap! I don't, like yeah. that must have been so great for you to write. It was one of those moments that just like clicked, um, and I really, yeah, I like I really I didn't know if I was gonna include her again, but I, when I came to that moment in the script, I was like, oh my god, I can bring Doctor Day back, and then I can also bring Nightclub back, and like I didn't even know that that was gonna happen until I wrote it, um, and it honestly became one of my favorite moments, especially like in the final issue in the whole series where. You have Doctor Day and Nightclub all of a sudden. Like they could know. get their own spinoff, and like that would be the greatest thing ever. Like love those them. two together. Yeah, and I love. I didn't even realize until after when me and Jeff geeked out about it that I had created this a new duo because Doctor Day's mm. parents are Doctor Day and Captain Knight, and then suddenly I I had created um, Doctor Day and Night Club, and then they were mm. battling together, and I was like, I didn't even know that I did that until it was like <laughs> after the fact. Um, but yeah, no, I, I, I love that moment and Gabriel just drew the hell of it out of it. And it's like, Dude, it's we like, so gorgeous. I know. And I know there was like, there was very kind of the action was very spaced out, but as soon as the action hit, like Gabriel was like, <laughs> it was what he did in those action sequences are so, I'm just so floored by them. It's beautiful. I want to give a uh, Gabriel like, uh, like, respect again because if you mm-hmm. go back to the beginning of the book and i know that you knew this was going to hit me like a rock the beginning of issue five mm-hmm. the not only the classic watchman style nine panel grid <laughs> but then you used the viral like blood on the side and yeah Damn, that was powerful. Like, We're afraid how, of our what, blood. I'm going to drench this comic in it is basically what, I did, <laughs> what we did. Because, like, it's so multifaceted because you have, the like, the blood of the Martian battle. You have the blood of the like the, the, the people who have, we've lost and, the, like, the blood of, of the virus all in, like, three panels lined up. Just so powerful. Like, what made you, like, decide to bring that to Gabriel? Um, I That's, like, one of those things that I don't, no, if I re- I didn't plan on using that um, until I was in the moment scripting it. Um, it's weird. Okay, I know every I I read Watchmen very late in my life. Um, okay. So I know everyone. Kind of this nine panel grid becomes like an instant callback to Watchmen, which kind of frustrates me. Um, I'm because sorry. I no it's no no not no like it's a thing that is reality and like obviously if I use it it's going to be called back to that, um, but. I honestly just see it as a tool and like in another tool in like storytelling. And I love obviously that you, it sets up these sequences across like the three lines, like a beginning and middle end, which I kind of played throughout the series. Um, So then in the scripting of it, I don't know what triggered the idea, um, but I think I was just kind of leaving the third panels blank. And then I was like, why don't I just add drops of blood? And then it just like became like almost like a ticking, like a countdown as it filled more and more with blood. I don't, I honestly don't know where the idea came from, but it just, it, it so did. Good. And I'm glad it did. <laughs> like, I, it struck me so it. hard when I opened the, the PDF. I was like, and it just, like, issue five just means so much because, like, it, there was a piece here that I had always 
was sad that I didn't get to see in Black Hammer, which was Mark fighting for his right to live. Because Black Hammer is like is such a moment of everybody's stories have led to this moment mm-hmm. versus you see Mark fight for himself and mm-hmm. separate himself from his father, separate himself from his people. Mm-hmm. And there's even that moment with Boaz where like literally he just goes, you're so filled with rage from your father, rage from hating me for no damn reason. You're like mad that I'm different than you. I'm going to leave you here to die. I don't even care anymore. And that spoke volumes to me. That ability for him to rise above hiding in like in his father's shadow. Like, I'm not like him. I will literally kill if I have to, but I chose not to because you're not worth killing. Yeah, I think that was that was probably one of the most emotional scenes, even though it's like a very violent, angry scene. Yeah. Um, as I wrote it. Um uh, I actually wrote it like pretty early. I remember I started writing the final script and then I was like, oh, I need to get, I need to write this Boaz scene. And I skipped to those pages and like quickly wrote down like what I wanted to build to, like what I wanted this huge moment for Barbie to be. Um, and it was obviously me <laughs> getting through a lot of my own rage and feelings about everything. Um, and this scene of Barbie just unleashing all this fury was obviously just like very cathartic and just. <laughs> Um, kind of dispelling dispelling all of that gay wrath, if you will. Um, In, indeed, like we've talked about that before. It's like this culture frustration that we have, where we've lost so much, and not only that. And like I've talked to a few different people recently, even another uh, podcaster about this uh, behind the scenes. Of there's so much with like DL culture and being on the down low, still hiding who you are being mm-hmm. angry that you have to hide who you are. And mm-hmm. not only that, but there's the fear of uh, ridicule, fear of retribution from people, fear of a virus that we can't even like escape from sometimes. Mm-hmm. And it's just, there's so much anger and frustration behind this. And there's even the moment in issue four where Mark tries to like literally come out of himself to Miguel and everyone. And Miguel's like, I'm a, I was, are you, we're going to say, I gave you the virus. And there's that fear of like, mm-hmm. we don't know if we're going to hurt the people who might being ourselves. And mm-hmm. when you're writing these things, especially when you're doing something that wrong, an emotional um, and Miguel kind of breakup scene or whatever. When things like this raw and just kind of pouring your head hard onto the page, you're always kind of worried that it's like too much or like it's melodramatic or it won't be received well. Um, so when it is and when steps where it's like the, it's been five years since the first case what like of AIDS killed a person and now we're still here fighting this fight and even all these years later in reality we're still fighting that fight like yes prep is great yeah. we've gotten better like when it comes to treating it but it's still a real threat for so many and Miguel is this vehicle to tell the story and he keeps um, like like speaking from from his heart, from his mom, like as a motivation tool. And I, I really like we couldn't talk about it as much before because he was such a small piece in the first mm-hmm. issue, but then also being a great piece because it spoke to Mark. But what made you like 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 just like decide on every facet of Miguel as a character? What made you create him like this? Yeah, so I knew obviously from the beginning that Miguel would be an important player. It's going to be a love interest, that he was going to be kind of uh, leading the protests. Uh, I don't think I knew how important he would be. And it, that kind of, he really developed and evolved as I wrote the book. Um, and it's funny because I, 
I love his moments in the first book, but I don't think anyone, like while I was coming out, I don't think people understood that he was going to be like a big part of the book. Um, and well, I, like, I, love... first, I remember like, like when we first talked about it, it seemed like such a fleeting thing of like, yo, cop, yeah. F you, and then leave. Yeah. Like it could have been such a minute thing, but you chose to make him this giant piece of the puzzle. Yeah. Um, and I think I even, I don't remember. I think I might've said this on the last interview is that I see Miguel as like the real, like he's the hero of the story. Um, and as I developed him, basically I needed someone that was the polar opposite of Barbie. Cause Barbie is this guy that fumbles over his words. He can't really get his own thoughts out or he can't express himself properly. He doesn't know who he is. And then Miguel is so fully himself and he like, he's been through it all. He's been through the ringer. He has nothing else to lose. He's going to say what's on his mind because he might not live another day to say it. So I kind of designed him that way, but he also developed in that way across the series. Um, And I love, I love the fact that, when he's speaking in the megaphone, like he, and he's in front of the crowd, he's saying all these things. But even when the megaphone is not there, when he's not in that performance mode, he's still saying these things. Because I, I needed him to be someone that no matter what situation he is, he is fully himself, like including yeah. like everything that he is. And he is like a pretty flawed person too. And you see that in his kind of breakup scene with Mark, where he's kind of so far gone in this that he's kind of depriving himself of so much and it's just it's it's i don't know it's very tragic and um and i based a lot of that on kind of like the survivor survivor's guilt that i read so much about of these men who saw so much of them so many of the people they love just die so it's just it's all very tragic and it comes from those men and it and and people who we're leading this fight. And I don't know, I tried to capture as much of their spirit as I could in Miguel. Um, and I, I don't know, I love him very much. <laughs> and I love what he became. So, but yeah. That's so powerful. I love it so much. <laughs> I just like, I think what struck me a lot was that mo. So, and like, it's such a small moment like if you catch it you'll miss it it's like one of those moments that if if like i the best way i could quantify it was if a het person just like was reading this to try to like be a good ally and they saw that scene they would either really it would really strike them or it wouldn't catch them at all they would just move on that moment where miguel gets his diagnosis and mm-hmm. the doctor is like oh hey there so hey i don't keep back up i have a wife i'm like oh. mm-hmm. it just it was such a moment of like, not only is he broken, but he's reaching out for a lifeline and the doctor is yeah. just like, no, no, God, no, j- please don't do that. No. Yeah. I, yeah. That's another line that I knew it was kind of on the nose, but I was just, there were moments of me like writing this and researching this where I was just so angry <laughs> and mm-hmm. I just needed these scenes um, to be in it just so people, it was like clear to people how, like what? Like it's the stuff we do on a daily basis. Yeah. Yeah. Like even in like 2021, we still deal with this on a daily basis, no matter what what goes on. And what's even crazy is there's that plus there's the the like the, the the reverse of it, which is the fear of our own people to like like to be out there or they'll be hypersexual uh, when it comes to it, but they can't actually tell it like the, the, the a true love. Like mm-hmm. you have true love on this page while also having true pain. Like the moments of of Barbie being with Miguel alone in, in Miguel's apartment are so amazing. And it's just, we rarely ever see that. It's either they're ba- like barely a character, mm-hmm. the, them being gay isn't talked out, or they have to be hypersexual when it comes to media. And mm-hmm. you don't see true love that often. There's outliers, but this is one of those ones that really just strikes you because it's so visceral, so raw, like you said. Yeah, and that, that romance was really important to me, um, especially building their relationship. 
in comics in general, um, in a lot of, especially, I don't know, mainstream superhero stuff, the heroes always have love interests that, like, I don't care about. <laughs> like, right? And I don't know why they love each other. I don't know why you're, like, either they're, in, like, if they're in danger, I'm, like, I should care that they're in danger, but, like, I don't, <laughs> I don't care. Like, I, don't I just understand. can't bring myself I don't to. understand who these people are, what they want, why they like each other. So I, I don't know, I really wanted the romance to be feel real. Um, and you'd actually care, especially about Miguel, but also like what he brings Barbalian and like Mark into and what they kind of get out of each other. So I really, I don't know, I dedicated a lot of page space to that because it was important. And I mentioned this in another interview recently about um, that first, like their first kiss scene where it's like mm -hmm. I did the full page spread, or, uh, me and Gabriel did. And Gabriel, um, I remember replying to that when he first sent that page and I was just like so taken aback by just the beauty of it. Um, and Gabriel replied that he was so happy and like proud to see this like romance in a comic because he like, he loves it so much too. And he wanted to bring this emotionality to it. So it was this, yeah. it was like this connection where we really Barbie and Miguel's relationship was like very important to us both. So we kind of developed that. And honestly, the emotionality that Gabriel conveys and then Jordy layers on top with their colors is just like, it really captures all of it perfectly. That's what's always striking about Black Hammer, like the world, is that you guys go through this ability to not only capture, like, for, like, for instance, we all know it's obvious Barbie's meant to be what if Martian Manhunter was gay? Like we we yeah. all know the reference; it makes perfect sense. But the the contrast to the like the coloring, the 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 the, the artistry, you make sort of this. I I don't want to say parody world, but like it's such a difference of like there's an abstract look to the art while also being so real about it. Like, these characters feel real. Their stories feel like they're people we know at the same time. Their struggles... Like, I remember reading Black Hammer specifically, and Gail's struggle. Gail mm -hmm. specific, like, like, like not being this older woman, but yeah. also, like, having to turn back into a child, the exact reverse of Shazam. And they got they got to a point where she couldn't get out of it anymore and she's just like yo i i will literally be ancient if i turn back like that kind of real version of these characters we've known for so long and then barbie being this like different version of martian manhunter who feels more real than the one we've known for so many decades now you've made a more realistic character than john jones how do you feel about that um, well, that's what I love about Black Hammer and why I'm so drawn to the universe, where I get to, like, take these superheroes and then kind of, obviously, it all references um, the character we're pastiching, but kind of, so I love that readers kind of bring that to these characters, but then I can bring so much of myself to this character, too, which is what I really did with Barbalian. Um, so that's why I love that about Black Hammer, where it's these very human tales and kind of the super heroics are just sprinkled in there or, or are yeah. like the dramatic kind of twists to your tale. Um, and that's, and I, and I always say it, but like, that's what Jeff, like that was his first piece of advice to me before me writing this was like, tell like the most human tale um, and kind of have the heart of it be at the forefront and then just kind of pepper in the action scenes and the Martians and the super heroics, um, which I really, I really did because I was I was so worried about people, um, on either not being interested in the drama and the romance and the historical aspect and being like, where are the Martians? What's going on? Um, <laughs> which is where, which is where the whole Martian bounty hunter kind of subplot came from. Um, where I was like, I need to have. Like people are coming in here for like a Martian warfare story. So I came up with a subplot that he's being tracked down. Um, and but then while I'm hearing people talk about it, everyone like prefers the historical stuff and the drama mm -hmm. stuff and everything centered on the AIDS crisis. 
And they're like, yeah, the Martian stuff is fun, but like, whatever, I want more of this. And I'm like, I love that because that means people want this queer historical content and people want yes. this drama and romance. And I don't know, I love that so much. Um, well, like, l l let's give Boaz his due real quick. Oh man, I know. Yeah. He's this character that is so like he 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 was like he's royalty. He's sent mm -hmm. down to like eradicate this plague he sees. This inferior Martian, like whose mm -hmm. father was a hero to his people, but then the like Mark goes to Earth and becomes this like inferior person by being with Earth men, and he gets mm -hmm. down here and he becomes sort of this like. I, I'm trying to find the right word for this. He becomes this caricature of people we know so well. He becomes mm -hmm. obsessed with murdering people. He becomes mm -hmm. like like fueled with the power that being a police officer gave him, or just being a like a white man in this world. He enjoyed mm -hmm. that power. And when uh, Mark checks him at the door and goes, "Oh, you 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 think you can do this?" Oh, okay. Well, I'm gonna beat your ass for it because there's that mm -hmm. moment where he tracks him down as the dude in the trench coat, and then they're like Miguel just straight smacks him across <laughs> the neck, calls him a Nazi. I'm like, yes, this is that real world shit. You like <laughs> you put action and made it real, and then when they go back to Mars, Mark's like, yo, no, I'm gonna kill the priest. I'm gonna kill you. Everything's just going haywire, <laughs> and it's so awesome because you made a real story but also put the action that should be in a superhero comic. Cool. Yeah, no, I'm glad you think so. <laughs> I was like, I was very worried that um, there wasn't enough action. And I was like, if I, the moment, moments of action really need to be like hard hitting or actually say something or speak about these characters. So I'm glad you think so. Um, and I love Boaz. He's kind of an example of me. I am incapable of writing. Um, and I'm not even like, I'm not trying to like, brag or talk myself up i am like really bad at creating like paper thin characters because boa was like supposed to just be like this dumb martian this this bounty hunter mm -hmm. then i realized again it kind of happens as i'm writing as i was writing all of this i realized that um i basically created this like boba fett obviously um and his name's like boa boaz so it's not that far off um, but he's kind of this like over the top, like macho, like massive Martian with all of these weapons. Um, so it's like, why, if he's this like huge of a force, why is he carrying around all these weapons? And then I just kind of got into like his like over performance of like that tip stereotypical, like masculine masculinity and like machismo. Um, and then I, I decided to like rip him apart for that at the end. <laughs> and it's like, all of it was like a show all along. Um, like, I don't know how well like, they broke him down to this base level and just threw him in the trash. Like, like you mean nothing now. Fuck your weapon. Fuck everything. You're trash. And I was like, 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 like there's that meme of Filthy Frank going, like, know your place, bitch. And it's just like, yes, this, this right here. Yeah. And it, well, it was something that, like, I didn't know if it would read or if I had room for it. Um, so I just, like, I always, I, I just make things far too difficult. So, like, I'm glad, like, Gabriel was like really able to kind of convey all of that, especially as Boa realizes that he's done for in the end. Um, so I really, I, I loved kind of the villain he became because um, I didn't really have, I didn't have much space to kind of develop him. Um, so I'm glad I, I really, I'm glad that we kind of did something different with him. Um, and obviously I just wanted to like say something about that overperformance of Machismo and all of that. Um, which I will always that, be happy to kind of tear apart. There's that, because, like, with that solely, and with it, like, even though Boa obviously isn't a gay character, but there's that, um, that forced masculinity with gay culture that you kind of spoke on without needing to, which is like, no femmes allowed. We, we <laughs> don't like femininity with gay culture. And you put that on, like, like on, like, a uh, stage right there with him. Like, like, we don't even know, like, Boaz's background, but he could be suffering from the same thing Mark is and, like, only, like, hit himself for his father. We don't know that, but that could be there. That's why he probably hates mark in a way and at the same time you're exposing this toxic masculinity that we deal with on a daily basis right there on the page yeah well I, yeah i didn't i don't know how much i didn't didn't know how much of it would read but i even just 
um, like that, even just knowing that was my intention. And even if it's just me that realizes, <laughs> I'm like happy with that. Um, but yeah, no, I'm glad. Uh, I'm glad it, it resonated with you or you kind of picked up on some of that. Most definitely. So like, where do you see yourself going next when it comes to a storyteller? I, I like, I, I know you have, like, you probably have something going on. I, I want to know what's the next story that you want to bring to the table. I know we, we talked about previously, you would love to do more historical content. Like what, what do you have in mind for, for, like, for, for the readers that really love this book? Um, well, I had, um, this is going to be terrible, like a terrible tease. Um, but I, <laughs> I pitched Jeff on like another story similar to this that um, takes place in a different period of queer history um, and takes one of his other superheroes in Black Hammer um, and does something along the same lines. But then Jeff was like, no, I'm not letting you do that. You're going to do that on your own because I want you to own the character or whatever. So, because like, so he doesn't want me to. So, like, I'm not going to do it a part of Black Hammer, but one day maybe it'll be like my own creation. Okay. Um, yeah, because Jeff has become very. I don't know. He's like <laughs> so supportive and just very night too good to me. Um, so I've come to him with a few ideas, and he's like, "Hey, you need to save these ideas for yourself because if you do them for Black Hammer, I own them, and I want you to own these ideas." So he's very. <laughs> he's just very nice. Um, so hopefully one day a lot. Of, some of these stories will come. To light, it's just hard. It's really hard to tell superhero stories in like the indie space. Mm. So that's why I was like, "Oh my god, Jeff, you're letting me do black camera stuff. I want to do all of these superhero things." Um, well, because <laughs> he's saying because like Jeff Lemire and I, I'm 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 a to toot his horn to the day he finally comes on the show. It's like, <laughs> like, like please, Jeff, please, like. Tate is mine. I love him. I want him to always be here. Like, but like, if you come too, we can do that. Like, 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 like I don't want to get it twisted. And I, I, I never want to seem like, like, like you're only here because of him. Because you are an amazing writer in your own right. You've okay, given me Barbie in the best way. I will always have him. You've like, 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 literally. If this is the only thing you'll ever write, it will mean like everything to me. It'll probably be one of my favorite comics of all time. Well, that was that was honestly my intention. I was like, if this is the only thing I ever write, I want to be like so proud of it, and I want it to like mean something. So like, that, was, like, that was what I went into it with. So I'm, most, most definitely, and it's like the Phil Jimenez cover was the first thing I saw about this project, and that right there, and you gave me that. That mm -hmm. was the best thing you could possibly done, and it resonated with me. And we've talked about that behind the scenes. Mm -hmm. So that right there means everything. When it comes to Jeff, he's done so many things in the media, whether it be Wolverine, whether it be Sentry, um, like the like the freaking Justice League United, which is literally just what if the Justice League was in Canada? He's done <laughs> so many things with other characters that have shown that like like he can play in other people's toy boxes. But Black Hammer specifically is what if I take other people's toys and make them better? And that's what makes this world so special. And you getting to take one of those toys and make it even greater means to me. So, like, that's why, like, I will toot both of your horns till the cows come home because you've done so much here. Well, thank you. Thank you for that. <laughs> like, like, that's why I, I, I want to see you do more. I want to see you create amazing characters. Like, even if it's, like, an, um... I, I was talking to Joe Glass about this recently, where it's like he created his, like his own version of Captain America a while back, and I like it was like the, the first like hardcore action book he had ever done, and I was like, yo, that's amazing! Like, can you do like a crime drama but make it gay? Like <laughs> that? Like like there's other like comic books out there beyond superhero books. Yeah. And, like this is a first like step to the bigger things like mm -hmm. crime dramas like 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 mysteries horror like a gay horror book would be phenomenal because we've we've normalized having het relationships on the regular in books and they're mm -hmm. boring they're freaking yeah. boring because we can't <laughs> see ourselves in that yeah. so well, yeah you could do a lot yeah no i definitely have like i definitely have so many um stories i want to tell outside of superheroes I'm working, I'm finishing up my next miniseries right now. And then I, I'm, I'm starting on my next one. Um, none of which I can talk about yet, I'm sorry. But Barbalian 
led to this next project I'm starting on. So Barbarian will, won't be my <laughs> one and only Big girl. I can happily announce. But uh, Barbarian will, um, opened the door to like this next project, which I'm very, very, very excited about, especially if you want more queer comics that aren't superheroes. Um, and then, yeah, bringing like just queer people to other genres and stories is also important to me, especially when it's like circumstances where the queer relationship isn't like the big thing that <laughs> about the book. Um, I just want queer characters existing. You want um, queer characters normalized, which is what yeah, we are. Yeah. So I will definitely always be bringing that into whatever career happens for me moving forward. Well, you definitely are able to come pimp it out whenever you finally bring it by. <laughs> I would love to have you because I want to support whatever you have going on. Cool. Thank you so much. Is there any like final words you would love to leave with these with these uh, listeners? Um, sure. Um, the thank you so much for listening. Thank you if you're buying and and reading Barbalian. Uh, that means the world. Uh, please share your thoughts and tell others recommend it if you want to um these books kind of live and die by people buying and supporting and showing up and word of mouth um the collected if you've been waiting for the trade the collection comes out in april um so like next month so not long um and it'll have some nice bonus stuff in the back and then yeah that's that's it about barbalian um and next to my library edition of the black hammer yeah. that on the shelf and then it'll be collected in a library edition too eventually yes. um so you'll get the huge format which is incredible um it'll be collected with colonel weird cosmagog so they'll be in one big one big hardcover together and wow. then yeah beyond that i remember last time you asked me if I wanted to direct um, anyone's attention to like a charity or organization to donate yeah, to. Definitely. So I'm also gonna plug uh, here in Toronto, there's the Asian Community Aid Services that I would love if you could donate any spare change you have, would be greatly appreciated. Definitely, I will have that information linked in the episode and on the tweets that we will be sending out because right now that stuff is important and always will be important. So mm -hmm. thank you so much for being on this episode.